I'm going to start. So, uh, I've been doing some work on the kernel pool on Windows 7. This is basically, you know, the uh, summary of the research. Um, Windows 7 in particular because they added some additional hardening to the kernel pool to prevent exploitation. This is really uh, the motivation behind this research. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a security researcher at Norman. Uh, on my daily day job, I do malware research mostly, uh, someone exploit detection, mitigation, stuff like that. Uh, my interests are mostly on vulnerability research. I like looking at operating system internals, uh, low level, pretty much low level stuff. And I found some bugs recently, so there's some more coming out, I guess, um, for those who are. So today we'll you know, go through all the internals it's going to be really boring, I'm sorry. But then we'll look at some cool attacks and we'll have some demos in the end. So that will really get excited, I guess, about that. Um, and, you know, being the responsible people that we are, we'll try to propose some hardening to the kernel pool to, you know, address these attacks. Um, then we'll wrap it up to the conclusion at the end. So, um, so exploit mitigations, um, such as Stefan is large, you know, they do not prevent exploitation in every case. Uh, you have stuff like chip spraying, you have memory leaks. You know, so, so applications now have shifted towards you know, using privilege isolation uh, in the sense that they use sandbox mechanisms to um, you know, isolate abilities in a sense. And, and these mechanisms, they rely on you know, security features of the operating system. So this has really motivated attackers and researchers to focus more on privilege escalation attacks uh, because, as you know, if you execute arbitrary code in ring zero, you basically undermine the operating system or the security of the operating system. Um, so the, the kernel pool is really just you know the resource for dynamically allocating memory in the kernel. Um, you know it's interesting because it's shared between all the kernel modules and drivers. Um, it's kind of similar to the user model heap. You know, each pool has its own structure, like each heap has its own heap base. Uh, it contains lists of free pool chunks. It is highly optimized for performance, and this is one of the reasons why they didn't really implement any checks from the beginning. And um, yeah, you have some functions that drivers use, uh, x allocate pool, x free pool. These are the, the algorithms that we'll, we'll look at later. Um, so if you try to define kernel pool exploitation, it's really just you know leveraging pool corruption vulnerabilities to execute arbitrary code in zero. It's kind of similar to heap exploitation um, in the sense that you know it's it's sort of like built on the same principles. Uh, so, but unlike heap exploitation, you know kernel pool exploitation really requires you to do precise manipulation. Is otherwise you'll end up with uh, in the most frequent case, uh, you know, blue screens, projects, whatever. Uh, and up until Windows 7, you know, kernel pool overflows could be generically exploited using well-known, you know, right core techniques. That is, exploiting the fact that when you take a chunk of a double link list, you essentially write a pull to an arbitrary address. So that's, that's that. Uh, and, and there's a, a few good papers on that, or presentations, one by Soviet in 2005, and one by Korska Kuczynski, um, as I have noted on this slide. Uh, so the first one proposed like two write for exploit methods for overflows, and then Kostya uh, in 2008 at SciScan proposed four write for exploit techniques. And they also uh, demonstrated a practical exploitation on MSO8001, which was a remote, uh, an IGMP version 3 or something, I think. And, and all of these techniques were actually addressed in Windows 7, so that's that's the reason why I, I wanted to take a look at it. Uh, so in, in this talk, we'll, we'll try to elaborate on uh, the internal structures of the kernel pool. Uh, like I said, it's going to be really boring, but, you know, it's, it's needed. We need us to understand, you know, to be able to identify weaknesses 
can show, we'll use that to show how an attacker may leverage this to exploit poor corruptions. Uh, and then, like I said, in the end, we'll try to find some ways of, uh, of addressing the attacks. So, um, on to the internals. So, um, the kernel pools are actually divided into types. So, and these are actually defined by an enum structure called pool type. And so you have non-page pools, you have page pools, session pools, a lot of different pools. Uh, non-page and page are uh, like the most basic ones. Uh, and it, each of these pools are actually defined by a pool descriptor. And this is the, the structure that a lot of the attacks will, will focus on. And it tracks all the al allocation and freeze. It keeps track of all the free chunks and double link lists. So it's kind of similar to what you would uh, look at in the heap. Um, and the initial descriptors for page and non-page pools are defined in a global variable called uh, pool vector. Uh, we won't talk too much about that, but you know it's nice enough. Uh, so this is this is the pool descriptor. It's it's like a structure. Um, you know the most interesting uh, fields for us is the pending freeze list, which is a deferred free list. We'll talk more about that, but it's essentially an optimization to uh, avoid a locking of the pool. They just push chunks on that list and then, you know, when it's spilled, they will process it all at once. Uh, we also have the list as lists, which is the uh, free lists. And that's, you know, the, uh, the big part of the pool descriptor. Uh, we'll look more into this later. Uh, I just want to go through the, the basic pool types. Uh, we have non-page pool, which is, you know, non-pageable memory. Uh, in the sense that it's guaranteed to be in physical memory at all times. Uh, you have a, like a global variable defining the number of non-page pools, and you also have a, uh, a global uh, array defining all the indexes or uh, pointers to all the uh, non-page pools. Uh, you know, on the uh, average system, on uh, the uniprocessor system, there's only one. You know, a multi-node system, there's more, but you know, Usually, it will only be one. Uh, I could talk about nodes, but you know, I'll skip this because it's, uh, yeah. We, I have a lot of slides to go through. Uh, so page pool, you know, unlike non-page pool, page pool can be paged off the disk. Uh, so we can access that, you know, almost any higher Q level. Uh, you know, on, on the, most average system, you define four page pools. So the way this works is that when you allocate something, it will like do a round robin thing. It will, uh, you know, try to distribute them evenly. On multiprocessor systems, there's one page pool defined per node again, and there's also an additional pool uh, for uh, full page allocations and for the type pools. But I won't talk too much about those. Uh, the last one I'm going to talk a bit about is the session page pool. Um, so when you log into Windows, you know, you're basically in your own session. This is kind of like a uh, separation uh, to, you know, protect each user, services, that sort of thing. Um, so we have a pool for that as well. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, so an interesting thing to think to note in this particular case is that you have, you have only page pools for sessions. Uh, for non-page pools, you use the global non-page pool. So that's not really separated. The non-page pool is global uh, in any case. OK, so um, the free lists, uh, if you've been looking at the heap or you know, the kernel pool, this might look somewhat familiar. So um, you know, free chunks are basically divided into, you know, they have like an 8-byte granularity. <laughs> Meaning that you know you have eight bytes, you have sixteen bytes, you have twenty-four bytes. That is really how you index those in those lists. So whenever you free a chunk of a certain size, you know you have that rounded up to the nearest eight bytes and put into the uh, appropriate list. So that is called block size. Um, and each of these chunks are also preceded by an eight-byte pool header. And uh, this is actually one of the most important structures in this case, or in for this talk. And that is this. Uh, so the reason why you have like previous size and block size, so when the kernel or when the algorithm tries to free something, 
it will always try to merge with the uh, with the chunks that are uh, next to it in memory. So it uses the previous size to find the previous chunk and sees if it's free, and if it is, it will merge it. Uh, the same it uses the block size to find the next chunk, and then why, uh, like in the same way, it tried to merge it. So this is like trying to defragment def memory as much as possible. Um, and the pool index is actually the index into the associated pool descriptor array. So when you free a chunk, it will look up the pool index and put it into the appropriate pool descriptor. And this is one of the attacks that I'll talk about later, uh, overriding the pool index and forcing you know, a free into an undefined descriptor. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that later. So that was on uh, x86, on 64-bit. Uh, it's almost the same except for the alignment. That is really just to compensate for the change in block size. So on 64-bit, the block size is 16-byte uh, and not 8-byte. Um, they will also move the process build pointer into the pool header, and that is really a pointer to the process associated with the uh, allocation. So when you make an allocation, uh, and you, use, you know you want to charge the quota for it, you, you look up the process pointer and uh, yeah, use that for uh, for subtracting or adding, depending on if it's a free or, uh, or uh, an allocation. Um, so so when you you know, have a free chunk, you know you you sort of like need to have a structure for. Uh, chaining the chunks together on the list. And this is the list entry structure. It has an F link and a B link. You know, it might be familiar, probably familiar to many of you. Um, this is also the structure that was um, you know, exploited before. You would just overwrite the F link and the B link, and when it's unlinked, you know, you get a arbitrary write with any uh, in data you want, or any pointer wide data. So that was like summarizing the free lists very briefly. Uh, there's also the lookaside lists. This is the, um, the fast list, the fast access list. So, you know, this is very optimized for performance. There's no checks whatsoever uh, when you allocate. When you try to allocate a chunk, the uh, algorithm will first uh, look at the lookaside lists. And these are defined per processor or per core. Uh, so. Let's say you're on a multi-core system. You know you have these lookaside lists to find for each uh, core on your system, um, and they are used for block size up to 20 uh, hex, which is uh, 206 bytes. And they also have their own uh, structure. Uh, you know the the top one here, the offset zero, is really the pointer to the next chunk. And you have a pointer to the next chunk, and so forth. You only have a single link list. Um, you also have some other values, but it's mostly for statistics. Uh, you know, the kernel will periodically resize uh, the, the single link list, so it uses the allocate hits and allocate misses for uh, for information on, on deciding whether it should uh, enlarge in the list or, or you know, make it smaller. So it's, it's kind of an optimization feature. Uh, so this is this is how you would uh, look at that, or how that is uh, put into the uh, these kernel structures. You have the KPCR that is defining the uh, processes of control region. Uh, following that is the processor control block, and that defines the, the non-page to the side and the page to the side lists. So nobody has to maybe. We also have lookasides defined for session, um, and, and these are put in their, the uh, not, you know a separate global variable, so they are not per processor, unlike you know the page uh, lookaside lists. Um, you know, so well, I'm, I'm not sure if that is you know why they did that, why they didn't do that per processor as well. I'm not sure, but you know they did like this. So.